um, welcome everybody. Um, thank you, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I guess uh, uh, if it's okay with you, Chuck and Richard, we'll go ahead and get started. Yeah. Um, Sounds sound awesome. good to me. Um, uh, yeah, thank you all for joining us tonight um, for our event with um, Chuck Polinuk. Um, my name is Evan Karp. I am the events manager uh, for Booksmith. We're an independent bookstore and a mainstay of San Francisco's Hay Ashbury district since 1976. A uh, little bit more about the store, Booksmith centers stories of the marginalized and underrepresented to create what we hope is an equitable place for everyone. Our store is open for limited browsing currently from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day. Uh, we're also doing curbside pickup from 11 to 6. And of course, you can shop online anytime at booksmith.com. Um, we're offering um, free shipping throughout San Francisco and the East Bay. Um, and we'll deliver right to your door <laughs> wherever you are. We'll um, be happy to ship internationally as well. Uh, this event is part of our Berkeley Arts and Letters series. It's a 10 plus year old program featuring exceptional authors with new books. Um, Berkeley Arts and Letters has hosted everybody from Masha Gessen to Bill Nye the Science Guy, Patti Smith to Michael Eric Dyson. Um, we're happy to be able to bring you a lot of our events virtually while we shelter in place to help stop the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, we'll be hosting Cory Doctorow on October 15th for his new novel, Attack Surface. You can find out more about that and get early notifications of our other upcoming events at berkeleyarts.org. Uh, Booksmith, too, is doing a lot of uh, virtual events at this moment, um, most of which are free to attend. Uh, we have Caitlin Doty coming up, Rebecca Runhorse with Charlie Jane Anders, and lots more. Um, you can find out more about those events at booksmith.com. Um, but tonight, uh, we are, of course, here to celebrate The Invention of Sound, the new uh, novel by Chuck Polinock. Um, each of your tickets uh, comes with a signed copy. Uh, if you haven't emailed me your address yet, please uh, be sure that you do that. Um, if you'd like to purchase additional signed copies, you can order directly from Booksmith, and I will drop that link um, in the chat shortly. Uh, about the invention of sound, which just came out last week, Kirkus says, uh, Polynok is an acquired taste, and fans will appreciate the story that scrapes like fingernails on a chalkboard and the familiar post-capitalism end-of-the-world vibe, um, as if there are other vibes right now. Um, but it might be a little too close for comfort for less amenable readers, which got me very excited about it personally. Um, with Chuck in conversation tonight is Richard Cadry. Richard is the New York Times bestselling author of the Sandman Slim Supernatural Noir books. Sandman Slim was included in Amazon's 100 science fiction and fantasy books to read in a lifetime and is in development as a feature film. Some of his other books include The Wrong Dead Guy, The Everything Box, Metrophage, Butcher Bird, and the Just Out Ballistic Kiss. He also writes the Vertigo comic Lucifer. And Chuck Palahniuk has been a nationally best-selling author since his first novel, 1996's Fight Club, uh, was made into the acclaimed David Fincher film of the same name. Palahniuk's work has sold millions of copies worldwide. He lives outside Portland, Oregon. And a couple of uh, house items before we get started. Um, uh, please keep your videos off. Uh, obviously, you're muted, but I encourage you all to engage in the chat. Um, if you have any questions for Chuck at any point, please um, ask them there, as we will have time for Q&A at the end of the program. Uh, we do have a one-strike policy in the chat. Please, nothing hateful. Um, we'll have to remove you, and you won't be able to get in. It won't be fun for anyone, especially you. Um, and um, what else? Uh, I think that's it for me. Welcome, um, Chuck and Richard, and thank you both so much for being here. Chuck, congratulations on the book. Uh, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? I'm, I, I'm never sure if people can hear. Uh, I can hear enough. you fine. Great. I'm assuming the others can hear you. So it's great. It's great to have you here, man. I really enjoyed the book. Um, like I said earlier, it's every time I thought I had it figured out, it really took me someplace else. And I really enjoy that in a novel that you're constantly undercutting my expectations of what the book is. Um, one of the things that the book is about, do you want to talk about the <laughs> Oh, hell the no. Is? No. Okay, good. Um, let people figure that part out for themselves. But one of the main things that's in the book is it explores the um, nature, the process, and the meaning of recorded sound. And one of the things that interested me about that was, this is not the first time you worked with the concept of sound. Your book, Lullaby, was also about culling songs, which are songs that kill. Um, there's a lot of horror in the book too. Was it the sound idea? Was it horror? Was it some combination that 
came together for you to inspire the book? You know, uh, ever since Lullaby, uh, Lullaby as a manuscript arrived in New, New York, September 11th, 2001, the day of the World Trade Center. Wow. And I really thought at that moment that uh, transgressive fiction was going to be out of fashion for the rest of my life, that you could not write transgressive fiction without it instantly being labeled as terrorism. Mm -hmm. So I really sort of, sort of saw a new age of horror uh, sort of dawning, that if people were going to make any kind of a message, they're going to have to do it through a uh, sort of a horror uh, metaphor, or euphemism. Mm -hmm. And that's why Lullaby, Haunted, uh, Diary, and now Invention of Sound, um, just ways to kind of address the culture without sounding didactic and getting caught without lecturing or haranguing or anything like that. That's a hard thing to do, to just sort of sit there and, and cut right into culture and not end up just, as you said, in a didactic kind of place. You did it really well. You know, and that's what I really most loved about uh, the, the stories of Ira Levin and so much horror from the late 60s and the 70s was that as a child or an adolescent, it really entertained me. And then as an adult, I could see what it was really about. Mm -hmm. And it entertained me and it engaged me on a whole deeper level. So I have read Rosemary's Baby a hundred times before I realized it's kind of about, you know, things like the letamide, mm -hmm. where you didn't know that what your doctor was giving you was going to make you give birth to a monster. Right. Uh, and Ira Levin, I wrote to him for years, we corresponded, and he could never really say that because he never wanted to be accused of exploiting the whole tragedy of, th of thalidomide. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but it's, that's what gives horror legs across time. Right. I'm glad you mentioned Ira Levin. He's, he's a name that doesn't get pulled up very often. And I think anyone here tonight who's listening to this would really enjoy Ira Levin and should go seek out his books. I'm sure Booksmith have some. If they don't, I'm sure they can get them for you. You know, Ira Levin always nailed a trend about 20 years before it became a trend. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but he fell out of fashion after his book Sliver. Mm -hmm. And once I, I saw a, kind of a, a, a discourse interview between Stephen King and Peter Straub, and they kind of made fun of Ira Levin. And that, that really broke my heart because I thought what Ira Levin did was so much more than horror. Uh, and yeah, I, my, my legacy is to keep his, his legacy alive. I wonder if Straub and King were, were it, was, it was like um, making fun of the old guys, the kids on the block having to trash the uh, predecessors. That, that might've been it, yeah. yeah. Someday, you and I will be trashed, if not already. Oh, I got, <laughs> I, I, I'm proud because I've been trashed both by Christians and Satanists at this point. I've had to yeah. do them both. So I'm, 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 I feel fulfilled in, in, in hatred. There's something of a compliment when you draw enough flack and mm -hmm. you're a lightning rod enough to get trashed by everybody. Yeah. Uh, that means you count. Can you talk for a second about, you use the term transgressive fiction. Can you give me your definition uh, of what that is or was when you, were, when you were starting out? I was never aware of it until it was kind of pasted on Fight Club by my editor. You know, mm -hmm. he had to file a copyright with the Library of Congress. They ask you for a description. He put transgressive fiction and sort of after the fact, I learned that transgressive fiction is basically fiction like uh, uh, the Monkey Wrench Gang, uh, mm -hmm. Train Spotting, uh, American Psycho, mm -hmm. that shows people really violating social conventions in order to sort of uh, feel alive or to make a statement, uh, kind of reinvent their world. So mm -hmm. it's, it's all about violation of social conventions. And yeah, I can accept that. 
Uh, it's, it's a label I've really struggled with because it sounds like offense for the sake of offense, but that's right. not really what it is. Yeah, I guess and also at the time that book came out, there was still, especially in New York, there was a lot of the concept of transgressive art with films, like guys like Nick Zed and even photographers like uh, Richard Kern. So the term transgressive was floating around in New York even at that time. So it makes sense that the editor would have landed on that for you. You know, and uh, Jerry, my editor, uh, had uh, uh, Carroll, Jim Carroll, had, had edited Jim mm. Carroll. He had edited uh, uh, Brett Easton Ellis. He'd el edited uh, um, <laughs> Urban Welsh. He'd, uh, wow. were, we were all kind of called Jerry's boys. Um, <laughs> I can't um, imagine trying to edit Irvine Welsh for an American audience. <laughs> Uh, Irvine is great. He's one of the nicest people I've ever met, and I'd love mm. to hang out with him. Uh, oh, that's great to hear. So now you've sort of, in a way, you've kind of moved on, um, and you, kind of what you're saying, from transgressive to the horror world. A lot of the new book is about horror film, and I'm guessing you're a fan of a horror film. We talk about horror books, but... There's a lot about film in here. Yeah, you know, because uh, I, yeah, I really wanted to do something. I always think of it as tableau horror. Mm -hmm. And when you think about horror books or horror uh, uh, movies, they always open with the scene of a horrific something. Mm -hmm. Think about the movie Seven. Mm -hmm. Every time we're, we're being introduced to the crime, through a tableau, a mm -hmm. still after the fact crime scene that suggests a long protracted hideous act of torture and sadism. Mm -hmm. And it's always unpacked through kind of forensic language and analysis of what's left behind. Same with the, with the alienist, you know, which was all about the murder of child prostitutes and the rituals kind of staging of their murder sites. Right. Um, da Vinci Code too. And so this kind of tableau horror is allowed because we're not actually seeing the violent act. We're seeing the aftermath of it. And I wanted to do that, but I wanted to do it with sound because I wanted the scream and the title of the scream to suggest the incredible violence that I couldn't put on the page. So in, in this way, and people have compared it to, uh, this is my edging book where all of the violence occurs at the end of the book instead of throughout the book. And so tableau horror, where you know the, each scream, each kind of staging of the scream implies a violence that's not really fulfilled until the climax of the book. The book becomes more and more filmic to me by the end with sort of quick cutting different points of view, giving us new information through even different char characters, even in the same room, seeing what's going on in different ways. You know, and that's kind of one of the blessings of minimalism is that minimalism kind of for forces you to keep your characters and your settings to a, a minimum. So that, you know, once you're 25 pages into the book, you've basically seen all the elements you're gonna be dealing with. And so the plot escalates very quickly because you're not introducing any new settings or any new characters beyond that point. Mm. You just have to use what you've got. And minimalism is also sort of cinematic in that you're not allowed to summarize or to use any kind of pejorative language to, uh, or abstractions to talk about what's taking place. Mm -hmm. So in a way you're trying to present it as uh, filmically as possible. Um, so God bless Gordon Lish for kind of inventing that style. Right. As much as he's reviled in some quarters <laughs> for, <laughs> for exactly that. You know, he's reviled by people, but when you consider that he would have almost 200 people in a class, mm -hmm. he really could not uh, pussyfoot. He really couldn't do a lot of handholding. He had to be a little brutal 
in order mm -hmm. to teach as many people as possible when he had 200 people presenting their beginning fiction. Wow. And so either he could be a nice guy and teach 25 people, or he could be kind of a, a dick and teach 200 people. And when you compare how many people really succeeded out of his, his coursework, you know, he made a huge contribution. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine. I've taught a couple of times and I've never, I've never had more than like 20 some odd people in a class. I can't imagine dealing with that, that just plowing through that much new fiction from people who don't quite know what they're doing yet. That's yeah. brutal stuff. Or you know, and the, the heartbreaking thing is that almost all new writers want to start with the most powerful, most important story of their life. Mm -hmm. And that is the least useful thing they can deal with in terms of craft. Mm -hmm. They have to so they're so emotionally attached to it that they, they can't see it in any kind of objective craft like way. And so they never get it right. And so they never kind of move past it. Um, and like myself, I, you know, I wrote 800, 900 page terrible versions of my first book mm -hmm. before I threw it away and had the freedom to write something I wasn't so attached to that was a lot of fun to write and was ultimately successful. Right. But students will spend years and years stuck on that same Genesis story that is going nowhere. Uh, that's the heartbreak. Yeah. I remember uh, Kathy Acker was a friend of mine when she was in San Francisco and she taught a lot and she had to go through some of that with the students. And I remember one of the first things she would tell them is, I don't want to read your diary. <laughs> when, you're, when you're bringing in new yeah. fiction, no, that is the last thing I want to know about. I don't care what you fucked last weekend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and that's kind of the tragedy when you go to writers' conventions. Uh, you see hundreds of people, you know, 800, 900 people who've waited until they retired to start writing. Mm. And now they're 70 years old and they're writing that what happened to me when I was a child story. And they're never going to get past it. And they're yeah. never going to get the freedom around it to really craft it as a narrative that serves anyone other than them, themselves. Mm -hmm. And that is the real tragedy is, yeah, damn it. Why did you wait until you were 70 years old? You should yeah. have, you know, tackled this whole skill set when maybe you were 24. Yeah. What was it? I think my first writing teacher said, you have a million bad words and you <laughs> start, start as early as possible and write as much as possible to get all the crap out so that you can find something good to say. Yeah. So, yeah, teaching is brutal. Yeah. I, would, I wonder, have you, have you taught much personally or? Uh, I have, I've taught workshops. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're, they're fascinating. People have to work really hard to get into them because mm -hmm. when we put the call out, we get hundreds and hundreds of submissions. People sure. are allowed to make a, maybe a 400 word submission and people are chosen, not based on how much money they have, because I, I try to teach, I try to charge what Tom Spanbauer charged me, which was $20 a session. Mm -hmm. And so by charging $20 a session, we're basically looking for the people who already have a, sort of a narrative gift. They have as much potential as possible because otherwise you're getting just the rich people. Right. You know, you could charge $2,000, $5,000, but you're just going to get the kind of rich dilettante people, not the people with any kind of, you know, skill or any kind of dedication. And the dilettantes just kind of want a lot of hand holding. They mm -hmm. want to be told that what they're doing is great already. Right. And, uh, there's really no joy in working with people like that. And they could really suck all the energy out of you, the teacher, and the whole room. If, if, you're, if you're going through that with the whole class at the same time, they're just vampires. Because they're, that's why they're rich, is <laughs> they're really brutal, driving people. And they are so sure about what they're sure about 
and they're not really teachable at this point mm -hmm. is, you know, in regard to writing. Uh, right. So yeah, it is kind of just a brick wall. Yeah. And so you've gone from, you've been teaching prose, you've been writing prose, and more recently, you're getting into comics, a whole new field for you. Yeah, comics were a big setup. Uh, there's a thriller writer here in Portland named Chelsea Kane. Mm -hmm. And Chelsea really became in, involved with the whole comics field. Uh, Image moved to Portland, Image Comics. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. uh, uh, Dark Horse was already here. Mm -hmm. um, there's another comic, uh, IVW. I IDW, cannot, yes. IDW. IDW. They moved up here as well. Mm. And so suddenly, you know, Portland had this huge comics community and Chelsea invited me to a dinner party. And here was Brian, Ma Brian Michael Bendis and Kelly Sue DeConnick and Matt Fraction and wow. all these comics people who were just hammering on me to do a comic. So um, it just seemed like a lark to learn this whole new skill set and to work with people who were so much younger than myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved it. I still, it was such a blast to do. It's a fun process. Once you, once you get past that initial first couple of pages of like, what the hell am I doing? It just takes off. It's so much fun. And uh, minimalism is a really good match for it mm -hmm. because in minimalism, you're already working with such, you know, so many rules about minimal number of elements. So again, the plot escalates as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And so you're not telling your artist, asking your artist to reinvent everything from scratch every two or three pages. You know, he knows what he's going to, what principal characters are always going to be there and right. what settings we're going to come back to over and over and what the themes are going to be throughout. So the artist can develop those rather than uh, expending energy inventing wholly new things. Are you, do you have any new projects in that area you're working on? Or in some, anything you can talk about, I guess, is, is the real question. You know, Fight Club 3 came out this year in hardcover. Mm -hmm. uh, this, the year of everything going wrong, I had yes. three books out. This is number three. Right. So, you know, Chelsea always said, that writing is a long con, yeah. that your success comes across a lot of time. Um, so, you know, I just, I fall back on that, that mm -hmm. no one year is a make or break year. Uh, yeah. Right. I wonder this year, I've, I've tried electronic comics and I wonder, because I know this year, one of the big problems with publishing has been actually creating physical hard copies of books and then distributing them to bookstores because of COVID. And I know a lot of people, I've, I've always had a lot of ebook readers, um, but I don't know about the, the comic world in terms of um, who were reading when I was doing, when I've been doing comics, who's been reading them as e-comics. And I'm wondering if how much the platform might change the way they approach um, your work uh, physically as opposed to uh, electronically, because I've always found myself having to almost make it filmic and like I'm zooming in on frames to get everything and to read it, which sort of makes it more dynamic in a weird way in electronic form. You know, I was always told, you know, in my short career that, uh, that comics people wanted the physical thing. Mm -hmm. They want the page turn reveal. They want the, the physical mechanics of how a paper book works. Right. Yeah. And that always appealed to me. Uh, I just feel like I spent too much of my life looking at a screen already. Right. Yeah. I know you can't get that splash page uh, moment when you're looking at something electronic, just that that full page, just punch in the face. That was, that was one of the first things I learned about was like, Oh, Right, full at full page, right in the middle of the comic, just to grab you and hit, take you somewhere else. Uh, and that's one thing that you can't do in minimalist mm -hmm. writing is that you can't do a hell of a lot of description because description is passive. And so right. that's one advantage on comics 
is I could tell, I could ask the artist the next page, we turn it and I want all these details included. I want that to be a page that people can look at for 45 minutes mm -hmm. and not soak it all up. And that's the kind of level of description I could never do in prose fiction. So that's just one of several different advantages that one medium has over the other. Right. Yeah, I, I remember that in the comics too, where you can just, you could just set the scene with a sentence, but then you could have a full, if it was necessary, have a full page of everything that every single person or everything in the background of the scene, what pictures are on the wall, um, what everyone's cufflinks look like uh, when it was necessary. And that's a really interesting process to deal with. And then seeing what the artist does with it, right? Yeah. I mean, you could, you could have a, sometimes the artist takes, at least in my experience, can take this minimal thing you gave them and just run wild with it. And you get these great surprises. And that's one thing looking, you know, I just, I didn't want comics to be kind of a, a translation of how I did prose. Mm -hmm. So just looking at what I can do in comics that I could not do in prose. And one aspect was uh, occluding things, blocking things. So asking for photorealistic things like popcorn or rose petals or uh, drugs to be seemingly scattered across certain pages so that it would negate what was being said. It would block dialogue balloons. It would block people's facial expression. Mm -hmm. It would block moments where I was just being too clever. And I could kind of cut myself off at the knees by blocking out most of a really clever little retort mm -hmm. and just kind of constantly negating or denying the cleverness or the sincerity of a moment by occluding it with what seemed to be a real thing. And that's something I could never do in, in prose fiction. So I loved that because it allowed me also to echo what David Fincher did in the Fight Club film, where he was able to break the fourth wall and kind of do the bear hole Brecht device of waking people up and saying, you know, popping them out of the narrative dream, sort of saying, this is not a real thing. Don't be this involved in it. This is an illusion. And so sort of bringing people in and out of different depths of reality. Uh, and I love that aspect of comics. Who, um, who were you reading before you started doing it? Who are you reading now that you're doing it? You know, I wasn't so much reading people as I was looking at uh, art. Mm -hmm. And the names of the artists, I don't want to say because we approached a lot of them and ultimately did not go with them. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to hurt their feelings by kind of saying, these are the people sure. we considered, but didn't ultimately uh, sign with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we can, uh, we can skip oh, that. But oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, is this, uh, is it Lou Fergredo? Duncan Fergredo, mm -hmm. the British oh, yeah, yeah. artist. My God, his covers are fantastic. That guy, you know, he is so overcommitted. And Joel Jones, mm -hmm. oh my God, Joel Jones is just brilliant. Um, I did a coloring book just because I wanted to keep a relationship going with certain artists mm -hmm. between books. So I did two coloring books that were just beautifully heavy bound, gorgeous sort of coffee table books that you could color. And one was a novella, and one of them was a collection of stories. Mm -hmm. But Joel did a story about the sinking of the Titanic. And she did this huge splash page that has the Titanic sinking in sort of the, the near distance mm -hmm. and an enormous amount of action in the foreground. And she did it so well that a man came to an event in New York at the Strand Bookstore. I've met him twice now. And he whipped his shirt off. And he was a bodybuilder and his uh -oh. entire back was a tattoo of this Joel Jones splash page. And it was fantastic. And he had to do this bodybuilder lat spread, this big sort of Batman, you know, flying squirrel thing mm -hmm. in order to show off the size of this huge tattoo. Uh, yeah, Joel was just blown away by it. But oh, that's uh, wonderful. Duncan Fergredo and Joel mm -hmm. Jones were two of the people 
that I will always want to work with. They're great. Have you, do you, a couple of, you talk about tattoos of your work. I've had a couple of people do tattoos of my work and it's like, I don't know how, how it felt to you, but like I suddenly felt even more responsible for my work when I realized people were putting it on their bodies permanently. It changed the way I looked at, you know, the seriousness of what we do as writers. I don't know if you had any, any experience like that. You know, so little of my best stuff mm -hmm. actually comes from me that I don't feel a lot of responsibility. If anything, I'm kind of the editor who hears people say remarkable things. And ultimately, I write a, a framework in which to uh, preserve and curate these remarkable observations I've heard other people say. Mm -hmm. And so when I see them tattooed on someone else, I never think of them as my own creation. I think of them as a kind of additional curating of this really bright thing mm -hmm. that was said to me maybe by a stranger 20, 30 years before that I could never, ever forget. And so in a way, my job is to make sure these things are not forgotten. Mm -hmm. Speaking of not for forgetting things, um, older comics, things like EC comics, I have a feeling played some influence in what you're doing. Uh, yeah, I grew up loving uh, uh, EC comics, which were called EC because they were called educational comics. Mm -hmm. But they really became synonymous with, you know, uh, Ert Lover Back from the Dead comics and highly sexualized, violent, paranormal comics and cautionary tale uh, ghost story comics. But they always, when, when I was a child and an early adolescent, they always had this combination of eroticized nudity mm -hmm. and violence and a kind of an inspired spirituality because they implied an afterlife. Uh, the people who were involved with uh, uh, making The Exorcist movie, uh, William Friedkin, the director, and... Uh, the the woman who did the screams, uh, oh, I can't remember her name. I don't know oh, name she about. was in Johnny Guitar. Uh, yeah. Anyway, oh, for a while. yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you talking about she, she was a devout Catholic, and she and Friedkin ultimately kind of said that they could rationalize The Exorcist because they saw it as a movie that cons that uh, confirmed the afterlife. And, cons and confirmed and demonstrated, presented a kind of struggle of good versus evil in which good ultimately won. So whatever, you know, whatever was in service of that, even if it was a lot of obscenities and a lot of vomit and masturbating with a crucifix, right. you could justify it because ultimately it was telling a good story. Mercedes McCambridge. There you go. Yes, that's there who did go. the screams. There you go. And my point was, with EC Comics, they combined spirituality because they confirmed an afterlife. They combined eroticism because they had these idealized, more often than not, nakedness. Mm -hmm. You know, when the guy was dismembering the body, somehow he would always strip down and be super muscular while he was chopping that body to pieces. And when the dead woman came back from the grave, her shroud would always be in tatters and she would have always the most fantastic rack. You know, <laughs> being dead did fantastic things for your boobs. And so it combined spirituality, eroticism and violence mm -hmm. and a kind of morality because it was always a kind of cautionary morality involved in doing the right thing. I always thought that it was there's something very Old Testament about a lot of the uh, morals in EC, that the angry God retribution stuff. And that's, you know, Cecil B. DeMille's big ticket to fame was he always got everything past the Hayes office because he could show as, as much booty as he wanted. 
as much nudity and corruption as he wanted, as long as the Red Sea parted and mm -hmm. Moses went to the mountain and ultimately it, it had a sort of biblical ending. And so it was that wonderful balance of, of uh, kind of smut mm -hmm. and righteousness that you could get it past people. Was that conscious? Do you, do you know if he was doing it consciously just to sort of mess with people or? I've heard that he did, that he, yeah. that was his formula. That's brilliant. Was to do as much eroticism as he could get away with and then, you know, put a biblical spin on it. Mm -hmm. But then of course, EC leads us to the comics code, which kind of changed everything, which is the haze, sort of the haze code of comics. Right. You know, it also created Mad Magazine mm -hmm. because the comics code did not apply to magazines. So it didn't matter how comicsy Mad Magazine was, it was a magazine. So mm -hmm. that's why it was Mad Magazine as opposed to more dirty comics. Uh, and so they, they were judged by a completely different ethic. And that was kind of the magic of just renaming the product because then you could get away with everything because weren't a lot of the early mad people ec people didn't they come out of places like ec i wouldn't be surprised yeah i think so um i hope i'm not making that up so i'm sure people can google it while we're sitting here and prove that i'm an idiot for getting it all wrong plus mad was satire too which i always assume you can get you can get away with more yeah. in satire than in straight, something like straight horror. And, you know, if you're, you know, depending on what age people are, people do or do not recognize satire. Mm -hmm. And so again, you know, you can be frightened by a thing at one age, like uh, the James Whale movies for Universal. Oh God, yeah. The Frankenstein movies, Invisible, Invisible Man movies. You see them at a certain age and they're terrifying. Mm -hmm. but you see them at another age and they're just really campy comedy. So they age so much better than something that's entirely just horror. Absolutely. Those first two, I'm a fan of the first three Frankensteins, but those first two John Whale ones, just, they capture something that uh, I've never seen in really much else. Um, Again, like you were talking about DeMille, I mean, just subverting so much stuff that was going on at the time. And certainly Bride of Frankenstein was playing on several different levels. And I've always understood that, that the reason why the universal horror movies really succeeded was because so many soldiers had come back from World War I. Then in World War I, medical science had progressed to the point where men who should have died in any other war Mm -hmm. survived. And so suddenly in the 1920s, we had men in society walking the streets who were monstrously uh, disfigured. Right. And people were faced with this kind of constant presence of these Frankensteins who were relatively young men and who were going to be around for decades. Mm -hmm. But they had half a face. Yeah. They really did look like monsters. And people could not publicly acknowledge the fact that monsters were walking among them. Mm -hmm. So by presenting movies like uh, Phantom of the Opera or Frankenstein, people had this, finally had this cathartic way of, you know, sort of venting all of this unexpressed horror that had come into their lives. Um, and also grief. Yeah. Uh, because there's so, so much sentimentality and so much grieving that happens in Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So I'm always looking for the underlying cathartic thing that horror is doing secretly that we're not allowed to really talk about openly at the time. That's really interesting. I remember the post-World War I, there was actually a group called the Men Without Faces in France. Mm -hmm. They actually had a term for it. Uh, and those World War I prosthetics where they really started developing what became very modern plastic surgery is fascinating. I remember uh, I wrote a book with, with um, that, those kind of disfigured soldiers in it. And I did a lot of research. One of my favorite bits of prosthetic was, you just mentioned, a guy with half a face. So they built him a plastic 
I, I don't remember what the material was at the time. It wasn't plastic, but half a face that matched perfectly with the contours of his real face. He didn't wear glasses, but the clever thing they did is they gave him, they glued glasses to the prosthetic. So the whole thing was held on over his ears. And suddenly, if you didn't look hard enough um, at this man, he was just perfectly, he was just another guy in the crowd. And that identity switching, I think, for, uh, at, that, at that moment in history must have been really fascinating for people. Both the soldier who was injured and the people around who may have been afraid of the injuries, but at the same time then dealing with people who they didn't realize were those monsters. And again, uh, take it back to Tableau Horror, like Seven, is that if you did take off that prosthetic or you did see the seam, you would suddenly be present to an amount of violence or implied violence that was almost uh, unbearable. Mm -hmm. And so Tableau Horror is that suggestion, like, like the scar is the suggestion of a moment that was almost unendurable. Yeah. That was a moment of almost mortality. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of playing at that edge of implying the thing without sh where I think that the most dread occurs. Mm -hmm. Are the universal horror films your favorites? Are there modern ones that uh, you really enjoy? I mean, I, again, I think I mentioned to you earlier, I kept thinking of Dario Argento as I was reading yeah. The Invention of Sound. You know, I've, I've always loved the... Uh, the kind of indirect horror films uh, that were kind of impressionistic. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking of Rosemary's Baby. I'm thinking of The Sentinel. I'm thinking of uh, uh, The Omen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that, that 70s era, really fantastic bubble of where we had horror uh, to kind of uh, express what was going on in Vietnam, what was going on in American politics. We went to kind of cathartically exhaust ourselves in these horror films like uh, The Sentinel, The Omen, Burnt Offerings. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one kind of undiscovered one that very few people seem to know about. And it was a really odd one called uh, Let's Scare Jessica to Death. Have you that's ever seen great, that? That's a great movie. Isn't that spooky? Yeah, it's the the horror is so implied. It's mm -hmm. like it's very similar in feel to uh, uh, Deliverance. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's these kind of sophisticated city people coming into this rural setting where there is a, a monstrous presence that they're not aware of. Yeah, I'm glad that you like that movie. Oh, I love uh, that movie. But then oh. later on, oh, going no, go to ahead. movies like The Horror, uh, The Hunger. Mm -hmm. I love oh, The Hunger. God. And really? uh, more recently, Session Nine. That's another movie people should know about that not enough people know about. And they're, for the most part, movies that don't really deal a lot in the tropes. They're not mm -hmm. American Werewolf in London. They're not a Frankenstein or a werewolf or a vampire overtly. They're kind of reinventing the trope or they're presenting horror in an entirely new way. You know, yeah. uh, Session 9 is a ghost story. It's a possession story. Mm -hmm. But you don't get that right off the bat. And so it's got a much slower build. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I think they work so much better. And Session 9, to bring it back to your book, deals with sound. Exactly. It uses sound as that sort of audio tableau that presences an entirely different plot line that's mm -hmm. not present over the montage of scenes. Um, other movies that do that, do you remember Clute with Jane Fonda? Of course. In Clute, at the end, when the killer is menacing her and he's about to kill her, he takes out a tape recorder and he plays the audio of his last murder. Mm -hmm. So we hear her friend screaming at the moment that she is murdered. Mm -hmm. And you remember Alien, the first Alien? Sure. Veronica Cartwright, she's the only person that kind of doesn't die on screen. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Tom Skerritt doesn't die on screen. 
he gets cut off suddenly. Right, right. But with Veronica Cartwright, Sigourney Weaver is running back and we're hearing her death over the sound system. So it's we're hearing horrible. this kind of screaming and screaming and screaming and then it's suddenly cut off. Yeah. And the horror of that audio is so much worse than anything we could have witnessed. And so which Session makes, 9 does that. Which makes a lot of sense in Alien because we just saw a brutal murder right before her sound. We saw Yafa Koto's death, right. which, is, which, is quite, which is quite violent. And then, yes, yeah, switching to just, just pure sound and that, that gasping at the end where it's not even screaming anymore. It's just, you can imagine blood pooling in the throat, trying to get air. Oh, did we lose you? Oh, there you are. Um, I, I was thinking- Sorry, about... you just froze up for me too. Oh, am I okay again? You're okay <laughs> again, sorry about okay, that. Okay, great. You were talking about implied horror, and I thought about, this is earlier than the 70s stuff, but do you know The Haunting of Hill House? That Robert Wise mm. movie? With Claire Bloom? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, oh, everybody. That's a everybody. fantastic movie. And that opens, it opens with what you were talking about, with the act of brutality, but it's so subtle, because again, it's just words. It's just the, you know, um, it's just the description of Hill House, and mm -hmm. it's very spooky, but it implies a history of just brutality in that house. And then the film itself, it's a ghost story basically with no ghosts in it, except for one moment that haunted my childhood, which is the moment with the door. The door and the carvings on the door yes. and the swelling of the panel. Nobody forgets that. Yeah. It was glorious. My uncle showed that to me when I was a child and it was just like, you know, man, <laughs> I'm six years old. What did you do that for? But I've never forgotten that movie and I watch it every year. And it's better than Rebecca, Holly Chase. You know, absolutely. Rebecca's good because it's got uh, uh, the crazy woman and the underwear drawer. Right. But uh, yeah, The Haunting of Hill House, the original one, it's uh, so good. And there's something about the magic of, I mean, I don't know how you feel about this, the magic of black and white to me. Yeah. It just, there's something about that, that draining of color sucks you into the dream, uh, I believe. And there's also a kind of documentary quality to black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was little, we always used to be, my father would take us to this, you know, this, uh, I grew up on a farm. Mm -hmm. And he would take us into town, a 40 minute drive into this desert town called Pasco. And we would go to this really skeezy barbershop to get our hair cut. And the skeezy barbershop would always be full of big redneck farmers chewing tobacco and telling fantastically racist, sexist, monstrous jokes, and then teaching them to us at oh, the age of, of four and five when we had no idea what we were saying. Right. But the coffee table was always these true detective magazines that were always full of crime scene photos that were black and white, and they were people butchered in hotel rooms in the 20s and 30s. With uh, and old kind of, photos or something, or just? Almost like Betty Page photos, but with black <laughs> bars across their eyes. The black bars like, made the everything black more bars. sinister. And so dehumanized them. Yeah. And so you didn't have anywhere to look except for at this hideous wound, the shotgun mm -hmm. wound or the, the stabbing wound. That became the, the center of the photo. And I think black and white horror films kind of carry that, uh, that authority of, of documentary cinema verite, mm -hmm. black and white. Mm -hmm. that, may, that makes perfect sense. And again, we're talking about a time um, where a lot of, if, you look, if you're looking back at that time, uh, a lot of news and things were still in black and white. So you'd have, you'd have um, footage of violent stories on the news. And again, you'd have, um, you'd have that black and white thing where they flew the film in, processed mm -hmm. it that day and threw it up um, on the news. So, the document, so we were used to that documentary and um, sense of violence. 
And, and also even going back to Citizen Kane, where newsreels were always in black and white for that reason, because right. they were always such fresh footage. And Citizen Kane could not open more or less with a newsreel and then switch to dramatize the newsreel in color. So mm -hmm. they had to kind of stick with that black and white that implied a gravity uh, and a tonal quality that was so ominous and so stark because it was all about stark shadows and highlighted areas and depth of field. Mm -hmm. And it gave it an authenticity. It gave it a kind of Blair Witch Project, you know, reality. Yeah. That sort of arose from the newsreel on the front end of it. Mm -hmm. I, I love Citizen Kane, but my big regret in life, and I put this in a book once, uh, a magical place where you could go see films that were never made. Mm -hmm because Wells's first film was supposed to be Heart of Darkness. Mm. And I'd love to see what he was uh, able to do with that because that's a horror story too, as much as, as much as it's anything else, I think. You know, I, I remember so little of that. I, I, now I get that mixed up with African Queen for some reason, so <laughs> it's gone. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Fitzcarraldo. Oh my Anything God. with a big boat in it. Oh, but now Fitzcarraldo is, is horror in real life. If you've ever seen Burden of Dreams, what, yeah. a, what a miserable, what a miserable movie. But you brilliant. Know, there, when you think about things like Cat People, there was some kind of experimental horror in the 80s that really did you know, kind of work in an 80s way. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and the original cat people, of course, were back to implied violence, implied awfulness, implied creatures in the night. The, those old, all those old Val Luton movies right. from that period, um, Isle of the Dead, just which is a which is also a, a war movie. It's a it's a horror yeah. movie, um, but also a war film, uh, the war in Greece. Um, Please, are 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 there any? So you're mostly in, you're a big fan of the 70s and it sounds like mostly uh, American stuff from the 70s or Hollywood stuff from the 70s or was there any? any? You know, it, it really goes back to the 60s and 70s because uh, I, I remember wanting to stay up for Night Gallery on Wednesday nights. Oh, yes. And we weren't allowed to stay up that late. So... Uh, Every morning at breakfast, every Thursday morning, my mother would have to summarize every segment, every story from Night Gallery. And that's how I learned plotting, because she mm -hmm. would have to remember every plot point for the story to make sense. Right. And so we would learn plotting from my mother, who would tell it plot point by plot point. And then later, after my parents separated, my father would get us for joint custody and he would take us to movies like Carrie with Sissy Spacek. Oh, yeah. And as soon as we got home, my mother would say, okay, what did your, you know, what did your goddamn father take you to? Mm -hmm. And we would have to reiterate the movie plot point by plot point without really even fully understanding what Carrie was about. Right. Uh, you know, Carrie was a really inappropriate movie for the age when we saw it at. Yes. Uh, but my father that's, that's didn't. That's the best time to see them, right? <laughs> it was so wrong. My poor sister sat there. Oh, yeah. And that was their primer demonstration, is this is what's going to happen uh, when your first period comes. Oh, my God. And my brother and I sat there without a clue what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But my poor father didn't know what else to do with us. Uh, and we still had to remember every scene so we could tell my mother exactly what happened in the movie so that she could be really angry. <laughs> so you were being coached to be a writer from a very, very young age. You know, we were yeah, being coached to be really aware of how the mechanics of plot worked. Mm -hmm. uh, and my friend Chelsea that I've mentioned already, her mother would take her to foreign films before Chelsea could read. And so Chelsea couldn't read the, the subtitles and her mother would have to whisper to her, this is what's happening. This is what they intend. And Chelsea learned plotting 
scene by scene or shot by shot as a small child as her mother was explaining the mechanics of the film to her uh, in French or Italian. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. A friend. And it, besides Night Gallery, we had uh, Night Stalker with Darren McGavin. Oh, the Kolchak um, um, stories. Which was made into more or less the X-Files. Yes. Uh, the whole opening sequence and Chris Carter, you know, acknowledges that as a child, he loved Night Stalker. Mm -hmm. And we had the Sixth Sense, which was on right after, I think Night Stalker was on Thursday night and the Sixth mm -hmm. Sense was on, on Friday night. Uh, we had so many horror anthology films or television shows yeah. to watch at that time. Um, and then on Saturday night, there was so much horror on the uh, ABC uh, movie of the week, right. uh, uh, Killdozer and The Car with James yes. Brolin. Oh, it was just terrific. It was a terrific time for horror. And for a kid in horror. Yeah. To fill up your brain with that stuff. Yeah. I, I, was, I was a Twilight Zone fan, but as a child. Um, but then Night Gallery came along and it had actual monsters in it. And that's what thrilled me. I remember they did Pickman's Model, that old Lovecraft story. And I was so delighted to actually see a real monster on TV. You know, what I love the most about uh, uh, Twilight Zone mm -hmm. is that Earl Hamner Jr., who was who fictionalized himself as John Boy Walton? Mm -hmm. He grew up to write some of the most twisted, warped stuff for for Twilight Zone, mm. and so basically, John Boy Walton grew up to write this really sick shit for Rod Serling for Twilight Zone, and then he fictionalized himself as John Boy Walton in the Waltons, and then he fictionalized the Waltons in an updated version called Apple's Way, which oh, didn't right. last. Remember and that. you know what his his big masterpiece was? Yeah. Falcon Crest. Oh my with god. With Lorenzo Lamas. Wow. You know, John Boy Walton grew up to write for the Twilight Zone and Falcon Crest. I, I find that so uh reassuring yes. that regardless of how noble your intentions are, you can still grow up to write shit. You gotta pay the rent, right? Falcon Crest. Falcon yeah. Crest. Mickey Spillane said that once. He said, I'm, I'm not a writer. Uh, I'm not an author. I'm a writer. I write to keep the smoke coming out of the chimney. I saw Chris Matheson in a panel once. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not Chris Matheson. It is Stir of Echoes, I Am Legend, Matheson. Oh, Richard, Richard well, Matheson. Richard, Richard Matheson, yeah. You know, he, he was talking about writer's block. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, in the 1950s, I had a wife and a mortgage and kids. And if you've got all those bills to pay, you don't get writer's block. Right. Writer's block is a luxury. You got obligations to meet. You just sit down every day and you just, you write to pay the bills. And I, I thought that was really an honest, fantastic thing. It really, I, I think that's a real, that's again, we're talking about, we're talking about teaching kids writing before. I think that's a lesson they need to hear too. That like, it's just doing the work sometimes. And so often the work is kind of tricking yourself into telling a truth that you would never consciously share with mm -hmm. possibly millions of people. Mm -hmm. And so if you can write about the fun thing, it's not really the fun thing because once you're a few years down the road, you realize that you told something about yourself that is so secret and so deep that you were not even aware of it at the time. Yeah. So the fun thing is kind of the place to go because it is the most honest way to get to the real thing uh, because you won't go there otherwise. Yeah. Well, that's a great piece of advice for your fans and readers. And you want to go to some questions from them? Yeah, please. Okay. Let me uh, pull something up here. Um, the Lullaby movie. Um, oh. people, some people may not know that there is a movie in 
I don't know, in, in, <laughs> it's not production, it's some kind of filmic limbo, it seems. Yes, and I have been told that there's a good chance the lawyers are listening. So uh, okay. I really can't say anything other than I wish them well, and I would really like to see them make a full accounting of the enormous amount of money that will that people very generously contributed to the project. Okay. Um, you know, they asked for 250,000 and they got well over 400,000. Mm. And that was four or five years ago. Yeah. And I would just like to see how that money was spent. Um, anyway, and I am, yeah, okay. really very, uh, uh, troubled over all that. Okay. Yeah, film people can burn through money very, very quickly, I've learned. Um, here's another one. I'm a new dad. This is from Rick. I'm a new dad. So when are we going to get Fight Club for kids? <laughs> oh. Uh, oh. <laughs> Don't be heartbroken. We're probably not going to get Fight Club for kids. Oh. Uh, but congratulations on being a new dad. Uh, damn. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's not going to be a, a, a kid's thing. Okay. <laughs> the, you know, Tyler, Tyler Durden, little kid story, sort of Tyler Durden, Muppet Babies kind of a approach. Are you familiar with, with what body farms are? Oh, I wanted to donate myself to a body farm, but there's a waiting list. Oh, you're kidding. The Mary oh. Roach book. Is it the Mary Roach book that put you onto body farms? Yes. <laughs> for, would you explain what body farms are? They're for, they are basically forensic tools in which um, voluntary dead people are hauled out um, and put in various circumstances and let to decompose so that forensics people can examine them and watch them rot in different ways. And by examining those bodies very closely and keeping track of them over time, that lets them um, be better at um, basically deciphering murder scenes. What insects show up in a body at what point? These are early insects. These are later insects, things like that. So yeah, man, I wanted to be dragged out and given to forensics people. And I started to write a children's book about a young boy who living on a farm and the farm next to his farm is bought by some mysterious entity. And he's so used to going into it, but like Christopher Robbins into the uh, the five acre wood. Right. And he meets a little girl. And basically it's their kind of playground. He thinks that she lives there. And the reveal is that she is the ghost of a child's body that has been deposited and that the government is running a body farm on this acreage next to his farm. And so it's a kind of reinvention of what is Chuck's mother's favorite horror movie ghost story oh oh yes what that would be brilliant what what is chuck's mother's favorite ghost story um oh i i thought you meant ghost story the uh straub thing no no ghost story was okay but yeah. do you remember portrait of jenny with jennifer jones no i don't know that one. Oh my gosh portrait of jenny i don't want to oh, give it away name. But it's a 1940s, really uh, haunting, spooky ghost story that starred Jennifer Jones when she was at her most beautiful. And the guy whose name I can never think of, who was in Magnificent Ambersons, and he was the supporting actor, Joseph Cotton. Joseph Cotton, yeah. Joseph Cotton and Jennifer Jones' love story paranormal happens mostly in new new york turn of the 19th century wow it is a haunting kind of gorgeous book very much in, in the in the 
in the cast of Daphne du Maurier of mm. Paranormal Fiction. It had that spiral staircase, Daphne du Maurier, a uh, 20th century, really early Gothic quality to it, and it's black and white. Oh, it was one of those, those women's movies made during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. But Portrait of Jenny, this would have been a children's remake of Portrait oh. of Jenny using wow. a body farm as its convention. That's brilliant. And actually, thank you for mentioning Daphne du Maurier, another writer who doesn't uh, get mentioned very much anymore. You know, you know, um, I heard that they were remaking The Birds, and that kind of breaks my heart. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, maybe they'll do a great job. You never know. It, it all depends on the approach, right? Yeah. And whether or not they kind of, kind of stick with that kind of quiet elegance that Hitchcock had. Mm -hmm. And whether or not they can get Ver Veronica Cartwright back for a cameo. Right. She played the little girl in The Birds. I didn't know that. Yes. Oh, she was, wonderful. what's his name's little sister? That was Veronica Cartwright. Well, she should be the lead, obviously. You know, she should play her mother. She should play the, uh, the mother, the, the, the matron character. Oh, yes, yes. Let's just hope he doesn't, no one gets tortured like Hitchcock did to Tippi Hedren, though. Oh, oh, really? How did that happen? The story is that he had that he was in love with her and she did not reciprocate. So some of the scenes in the birds where she is being brutalized are more real than they should be because he wouldn't call cut. Now, somebody just mentioned The Haunting of Julia in 1977. Are you aware mm -hmm. of that with Mia Farrow? Does that ring a bell? Well, yes, yes. I don't know that one. Uh, I have a vague memory. I mean, there's. Mia Farrow from that period was just ghostly in herself. She had such a, she's sort of a Tilda Swinton okay. of that period. Um, yeah. I don't remember, I remember her being haunted and not in, the, not in the ghostly sense. I remember her, a softer version of Rosemary's Baby in that sort of lost way. Okay. Um, I hope I'm not screwing up and thinking of a different movie because I'm not recalling the plot terribly well here. I will look for it. I will look for it. Uh, Kay Holmquist. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Let me uh, look for something else here for you. Um, this is from Joshua. Thank you for such a brilliant and mesmerizing conformity defying career. Um, what transgressive writers or films inspired or shocked you before? Uh, before your first novel. I think we kind of covered some of that. Or is, is there somebody else you want to mention? You know, before I forget, uh, another sort of movie from that era was uh, Aubrey Rose. Yes, that's a great, a great movie. And I wondered, I, I kind of saw some, I was wondering if Stephen King saw that movie. Uh, uh, does it remind you of a specific Stephen King book? Um, because it's a, more or less about reincarnation. Yeah. And it was part of a, uh, re, uh, the, the Bridie, uh, what was the famous Irish reincarnation book that reinvented, you know, it led up to uh, Bridie, what's her name? Uh, and sure. Aubrey Rose and the reincarnation of Peter Proud. I remember with that. David one, yeah. Sarazen. Sure. Uh, I, I don't know the Irish one. It'll pop into your head, right? Right in the middle of something else. So things that impressed me, that was the question, right? Yeah. Uh, were you a Burroughs reader when you were young? Like Naked Lunch or any of that stuff? Or no, you know, because I was, I was the last kid in my class to learn to read. And I swear it was close to third grade before I finally got it. And every night in the kitchen, I would be more or less almost in tears because I could not make sense out of this whole uh, system of symbols on paper. It didn't, it didn't click. It was like uh, I was one of the last kids to, to tell time. I mm. couldn't figure out what people were talking about when they talked about 
time in relation to these symbols on this round disc. Mm -hmm. And I, that's another reason why I think I attached so much to writing is that at the moment that I finally got it, it felt like such a, a victory that I wanted to re experience that victory over and over for the rest of my life. And I think that's why I try to reinvent the narrative conventions with every book mm -hmm. is that every book and every short story has to feel like I'm learning how to read all over again. So I have to reinvent writing all over again to try to re to try to sort of revisit that fantastic euphoria of not being the stupid kid because until third grade, I was the stupid kid. Okay. And the burden of being the stupid kid uh, was just crushing. It was horrible. Oh, yeah, sounds like it. Do you remember the first thing you read that, um, that just thrilled you once you got it? Oh. You know, I talked about this a little bit the other night, but there was a a really monstrous book from the mid 70s called Let's Go Play at the Adams. Oh, I don't know that. Oh my God. It was the fictionalized account of a suburban Connecticut upper middle class family. The parents were going to go to Europe for the summer. So they hired this college student. And I remember that in the book, she was very physical in that she was a, a college scholarship swimmer. So mm. she was very statuesque. She was very beautiful and very fit, very muscular. Mm -hmm. And within a couple of days of her being the stay at home nanny, sort of uh, babysitter for these suburban kids, they drugged her, they stripped her, they tied her spread eagle to a bed. And then they invited all the neighborhood kids over to rape her, and to torture her for the entire summer. There was a film about this. It was fictionalized from an actual case in the Midwest where yeah. they had hired a college girl and the family who hired her and the neighbors ended up all brutalizing this poor girl. Anyway, from the moment she is tied up, you know how horrible this is gonna be. And I got that from the County Extension Service mail library. They <laughs> sent that book in a packet of books that we ordered through a catalog because that's mm -hmm. how, how you order library books in like 1973 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I read it because it had a childlike title, Let's Go Play at yes. the Adams. And by the end of the book, they are killing her in such a fantastically sadistic way. And she is entering these delirium scenes that that book, and guess what other embarrassing book have always stayed with me? Oh. What is the most misanthropic, gothic novel of all time? Um, I'll give you a clue. Okay, help me out. Canada, here. Canada. Martin Sheen, Jodie Foster, oh, Chopin. Oh, 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 Chopin. Oh. I know what this is. Of course this you do. Girl, the little girl who lives down the lane? The little girl who lives down the lane. Every child <laughs> who wants to kill everyone yes. loves that book. And when I was an usher in, a, in, in movie theaters as, as a teenager, that movie came back as a double feature with every other movie. Wow. So I saw Jodie Foster kill people hundreds of times. And I saw that hamster get killed thousands <laughs> of times. But that's what I, that was my ideal life, is to be the kid alone living in the rural house on the seashore, killing people. Isn't that embarrassing? No, that's not embarrassing at all. It makes perfect sense. I, I would have, I would have been the same thing if I, if I'd have been exposed to that at a certain age, just that, that adult power, because that's, that's the thing, right? It's, it's all power for a little kid. Ultimately, she kills a child molester. 
-hmm. So I wonder if that's where I'm getting invention of sound from, because it's right. ultimately about killing your molester. Mm -hmm. Whoa. You just have a moment there. I just went through like 10 years of therapy. <laughs> Um, well, it, that's, you know, back to the invention of sound. Memory is a huge part of that book. Everyone's memories and how it shapes and distorts uh, people in the present and how they can lie to themselves and how they can selectively not, not have memory. Is that something you think about? Or is that just for this book? You know, oh... To give credit where credit is due, I learned a lot about the awareness of physical memory from the writer Lydia Yuknovich. Mm -hmm. And Lydia really writes and speaks very profoundly about how we don't remember things, and, but our body remembers things. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, writing is a kind of you know, intellectual way of tricking yourself into remembering what your body still remembers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm always aware that that writing is a way of kind of fooling yourself into remembering what you don't want to remember and so I think that about characters is that the, the physical plot is a journey that tricks them into recognizing something mm -hmm. like Rosemary Rosemary's baby tricks us into mourning the tragedy of, of the thalidomide right. that we would never openly mourn because to openly mourn it is to in a way dishonor it mm -hmm. we have to grieve it on a scale that is equivalent to the scale of the tragedy right and we cannot do that deliberately we have to do that through a symbol in the way that it, you know that god is only kind of present in religion through symbols right these can't these things can't be addressed directly um and so I think that's why my characters always kind of have a huge blind spot. They're totally unaware of the nature of their existence mm -hmm. until the end. Have you ever seen the other thalidomide uh, movie, Scanners, by David Cronenberg? Oh, you know, I have seen it. That was a drive-in movie in my day. Uh. Uh, I don't remember it very well. Uh, but I, I sort of lumped that in with uh, The Brood. Oh, yes. Oh, Absolutely. I had such a boner for Samantha Agar, <laughs> that redheaded <laughs> British actress. Yes. Until she started giving birth to those bulbous babies and ripping mm -hmm. their placentas open with her teeth. Yes. And that was the end of my Samantha Agar thing. So, <laughs> damn. Oh, the other thing about my childhood is yeah. we had dark shadows. Oh, dark and you shadows. had nothing unless you had dark shadows. Yes. Oh. You want to tell people what dark shadows is if they don't know? What's that? You want to oh, tell people yes, about please. dark shadows in, in case? No, why don't you tell, why don't you tell them? Dark Jonathan, shadows. Jonathan Frid. Oh, uh, who was the major hottie from dark shadows? Oh my God. I, I cannot can, remember. Can, can, the rookies? Charlie's Angels. I'm blanking. I'm coming. Kate up Jackson. Here. Kate Jackson was in Dark Shadows. She was. She was a, a brand new ingenue, and she was beautiful in Dark mm -hmm. Shadows. She was the ultimate gothic brunette. She was so beautiful in Dark Shadows. Uh, men, women, everybody loved Kate Jackson in Dark mm -hmm. Shadows. Oh. Anyway, but it was, it was the, for people who don't know, it was an afternoon soap opera with vampires, werewolves, and the most gothic storytelling you can imagine in a soap opera format, yeah. five days a week, just addicting for kids. And it was on after the edge of night. So we would race oh, another, home. Oh, that's was that? great. Another, so another, it was like a regular soap opera, right? But it was, it was, it was kind of a noir soap opera. Okay. It was very Raymond Chandler, very sort of, uh, uh, you know, the evil world. Uh, 
who am I thinking of? Raymond Chandler and Hammett, maybe Dashiell or... Hammett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking of uh, Lily, Lillian Hellman, Dashiell Hammett. Oh, but the Edge yeah. of Night was totally noir. And if you got home from school early enough, you could see the last ten minutes of mm. Edge of Night before you watch Dark Shadows. Oh, I have to go look at see if that's on YouTube or something. Edge of Night. That would be great. Yeah. Damn. Uh, please go ahead. I'm I'm rambling. Yeah. Um, let's see. Scott says uh, asks, "Is Rant going to have a sequel?" Uh, Scott, oh boy, the uh, economics of book publishing yeah. is that if a book does not sell enough, the publisher will not ever put a sequel under contract. Yeah, and Rant did not sell enough. Uh, Doubleday would never uh, go forward with a sequel. Yeah. So, you know, I can only hope that someday I have enough money that, you know, maybe I could self publish a sequel. But, uh, you know, Rand just didn't make enough money for a random house. So, hey, there, Kickstarter, there. man. You, you do get a Kickstarter going. <laughs> I don't want to go there, but I just don't want to. Uh, uh, disappoint people you know uh right crowdfunding is uh yeah it's been kind of a a, a bone of contention mm -hmm. uh, so right i can see that with your with yeah. yeah uh yeah i know i think i know what you're talking about um let's see andrea asks how many times do you revise rewrite your first draft of a new story until you find it publishable Or do you have a process? Do you have a specific process like that? Or it sounds like you change things from, from fiction to fiction. It's more or less the same process, but it's a little smoother now, but not much. Mm -hmm. You know, my book, Invisible Monsters, which was more or less the first saleable book that I wrote, I ended up physically rekeying that book three times because I wrote it on such primitive software the first time mm -hmm. that I couldn't convert it to ASCII. I couldn't convert it to any other software. Okay. So by the time I actually got it under a book contract in 1999, the, the, the software was so out of date that I had to rekey the entire book into new software. And that software was so massively out of date that I had to rekey it a third time. Oh my and God. so every time was a massive rewrite and in between every time was several massive rewrites. So Invisible Monsters was rewritten 20 times, entirely wow. 20 times. Wow. Uh, Fight Club was rewritten massively many times. And I never think of them as rewrites because I never stop working on them more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it's hard to think of them as rewrites because it really is years and years of, of concentrating on, you know, sculpting this thing over and over. Right. Uh, it's never just kind of once or twice through. It's a continual, you know, labor. Mm-hmm. Do you keep those old drafts of uh, early versions that uh, you don't like? You know, uh, that's one of my kind of idi idiosyncrasies is I burn everything. Good for and, you. Uh, I do the same. <laughs> you know, I always thought that Kafka was kind of betrayed when he asked that all of his work be burned. Yeah. And it wasn't burned. And so I just don't trust anybody. So all my notebooks, all of my correspondence, mm -hmm. I've got a big wood stove and every winter I heat the house by burning <laughs> every manuscript, all the foul matter that comes back from the publisher, right. all the correspondence. It's never gonna go to a university because it goes up my chimney. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't regret that, Yeah, um, you know, not at all. And you, I, my other fear, and I know other writers who feel like this, are like trunk stories. 
yeah. things you just and and then you know the moment you die someone's going to find it and put it out and you 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 didn't sell it in your lifetime because you hated it so why keep it around i i totally agree with you and one spooky thing is um i was asked to do some uh, original writing for a subscription service and so i went to the service to to see what they had of mine and someone had, had actually uploaded pre-edited versions of some short stories of mine mm. that had only gone to my editor. So someone in my editor's office had wow. uploaded these PDFs of stories that should never have seen the light of day, at least not in that form. Right. And it just made me a lot more wary about, uh, you know, sending anything anywhere mm -hmm. uh, because I just don't want the really crappy stuff to get out there. The kind right. of half formed stuff. Oh, there was one bad experience with, with an anthology. They'd asked for a story. They'd come to their press deadline. They needed to put the folio together to see how long it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And I said, I've got the story ready, but I don't have the ending right. So I will submit the story but you've got to come back to me for the final ending. Uh oh. And a week later, I had the ending perfect. And I went back to them and they said, we, we've gone to press. And they went to press oh, with man. the shitty first draft ending, which oh, was not nearly as strong as it should have been. But then the weird thing is Patton Oswald, the comedian, yeah. contacted me asking for the rights to anthologize that story in a collection. And I said, well, it's the version you've seen has got the really shitty first draft ending. And I want to make sure that if it is anthologized, it gets the correct ending. And after a little back and forth, the kind of the deal kind of fell apart. Mm -hmm. But it's that kind of, you know, uh, you know, slip ups that make me really wary of yeah. letting the less than finished stuff get out there. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see, I'm trying to find a really good one. Um, no, we're not gonna talk about politics. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite brand of notebook and or pen? This is... Oh, I wish I had the pen. Uh, Impact gel point, one millimeter blue. Blue, it, okay. I can't it is blue. like air guitar. It is so soft and so smooth that you can write long inscriptions in hundreds of books mm. and your hand never gets tired. And the one millimeter, uh, you know, track is yeah. so bold, it's so gorgeous. But the one drawback, is on glossy paper in graphic novels. Mm -hmm. It takes a couple minutes to dry. And there was this, yeah. uh, there was a beautiful young woman in Boston. I wrote in her book, we did this kind of grappling photo where we were kind of grappling and embracing at the same time. And afterwards, I handed her the book and I said, please keep this open for a couple minutes because it's still wet. Mm -hmm. And in front uh -oh. of hundreds of people, she said, Damn, after that, it's not the only thing that's wet right now. <laughs> and that was such a great moment. That was such a great pickup. When people can pick up the comeback like that in Baltimore at the Pratt Library with like 700 people, I threw out sex dolls on the stuff tour. <laughs> and one of the sex dolls, I did a John Waters mustache on it. And I threw these all out and people competed to blow them up. And I said, okay, who got the mustache? You get a prize. And it's this, this one college age young guy and he holds up his sex doll. And I said, you just blew John Waters. <laughs> and without missing a beat, this kid says, it wouldn't be the first time. And it got <laughs> such a huge laugh and he got the laugh, which was the glorious thing is when you can set somebody else up to get that moment of victory. 
Yeah. That feels fantastic. Oh, that's great. That's a great story. Um, and you know what the important thing yeah. is? Mm -hmm. That snuff thing happened probably close to 10 years ago. Yeah. And I still remember it. And I remember that guy. And I remember that girl in, the, in Boston. Yeah. And that's why I do this. Because it gives me these extraordinary moments that after a certain point in life, they become more and more rare. And you have to work hard to make these extraordinary connections happen in your life. Uh, you know, and that, that might sound uh, uh, sentimental or mm -hmm. stupid, but I really mean that, that you have to really work hard to make these things continue to happen to you as you grow older. Uh, the end. Yeah. No, I think that makes perfect sense. I mean, at a certain point, you've experienced so much. It's like, it's like music. At a certain point in my life, I found that all music sounded like music I heard 20 years ago, which forced me to go find new forms of music. And that's why the, the, the best ideas always come from other people. Mm -hmm. When you overhear something extraordinary or in the workshop where I was teaching until COVID, we were talking about a used magazine store that had just shut down. And somebody said, uh, uh, so the people who, who have big boxes of Playboy magazines can't sell them anymore. And somebody else said, I wonder if that's how the big box of porn in the woods happens. And everyone at that table from the age of like 18 years old to like 65 years old, all lean forward because as children, they had all found a big box of porn in the woods, Yep. but they found a duffel bag or a garbage bag or a banker's box in the woods or in a tree or in a vineyard or on a beach or in a desert. I found mine in the desert uh, or under a dumpster. And they thought it was just them and they had never told anybody or if they had told their parents, mm -hmm. they were so intensely shamed that they'd never told anybody. Yeah. And at that moment, everyone leaned forward and I realized that is a universal human experience that needs to be recognized. The big box of porn in the woods. <laughs> And originally we'd all decided that we were gonna do, we were gonna as a group write an anthology, each mm -hmm. fictionalizing that experience. But when we took it to publishers and we said, we'd like to call it, uh, we were gonna call it children of the porn. <laughs> the publishers all said, that is a book that bans itself. Yes. That is never gonna happen. Uh, but it's that kind of idea that comes from outside but it resonates inside mm -hmm. that you're always, always looking for. Okay. Um, this is from Emily. Chuck, I love how you avoid gender stereotypes when writing female characters. As a male writer, how do you manage this? Do you have female friends or colleagues you use for inspiration? Oh boy. You know, verbs. I think if you just focus on verbs, the character taking action, constantly taking action, then uh, people react to verbs in a, a physically sympathetic way. And they put their own experience into the book. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you, verbs and also using more or less generic physical settings, bathrooms, airline cabins, everybody knows what these things look like. So you don't have to lapse into a kind of static descriptive voice to describe this very specific place because everyone can impose their own place on that place. And everyone's body will react in a sympathetic way to the verb. There are these brain studies that show that, that when people read a verb, the portion of their brain that would be accomplishing that act, whether it's kissing or kicking or hitting a ball, or whatever, that that part of their brain lights up as if they were actually doing that physical act. Mm. But when they read an abstract verb like thought, remember, love, recall, believe, 
it doesn't have that same physical sympathetic brain reaction. So it doesn't matter what gender the character is, uh, that the physical verb will rope people in regardless. Um, and I want to do that. I want to make the books as inclusive as possible. And that's why I always decline to kind of state the ultimate meaning of any of the books. Number one, because it's so personal that I don't want you to know what it actually means. And number two is because I don't want to dictate a meaning that precludes your meaning. Um, can I tell you a, a, a story that broke my heart once? Sure, of course. I was driving with a friend through the desert in, in Eastern Oregon. And in Oregon, you can't pump your own gas. And in the middle of the night, maybe one, two o'clock in the morning, we stop at this isolated truck stop in the middle of nowhere. And the guy that comes over to pump our gas is reading a book. And in the middle of all this black desolation, he sets the book on top of the gas pump. He pumps the gas and he goes back to the book. And I see that the book is Invisible Monsters. Wow. And I'm thinking, this guy who was working the graveyard shift in this completely deserted truck stop in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night, he's finding comfort and distraction in reading Invisible Monsters. Mm -hmm. And I'm not about to step in and say, I wrote that book. Right. I bet you don't know what it's really about. <laughs> because I want him to be in the book. Yeah. And that's something that physical verbs do is they put you in the book, regardless of who you are in relation to uh, who the character might be. Okay, let's see. Um, well, let's, we'll save that for later. Um, what are your thoughts on self-publishing? This is, that's from Liz. I hear a long pause. Well, you know, it's me gathering my thoughts. I know, um, that's, that's what I was thinking. In a way, I think that self-publishing is kind of the wave of the future. Mm -hmm. Because I think more and more that writers might have to take the, the cream off the top and then after the fact offer a wider contract to publishing houses. Mm -hmm. Because unless writers take that cream off the top, they may not make enough money to get by. So yeah. if you can self-publish, build a large enough readership, and then get a contract and get sell foreign rights, I think that might be the new trend. Mm -hmm. But the caveat is that you should be really careful because you get one first book. And I am so glad that Fight Club was my first book. Because if I had self-published that 800 piece piece of crap that I'd first written, mm -hmm. I'd be so embarrassed for the rest of my life. And I'm so glad that I didn't have the ability to bring my kind of formative work into the world before it was ready. Yeah. I think that's a lot of the self-published stuff I've seen some of it's really good, but you, you at least I feel like you, you suddenly see the lack of an editor. Yeah. And we complain about our editors sometimes, but my God, they save us too. Uh, Doug Copeland, who wrote Generation X, is a friend sure. of mine. And Doug has told me so many times that Generation X was such a sensation that after that, his editors kind of quit editing him. Mm -hmm. And he really wishes that they had edited him much more uh, stridently, much more demandingly after that, uh, because it would have forced him to, to grow and it would have forced his subsequent books to be so much better. Mm -hmm. I can see that, that um, you'd lose touch with that, the rigor <laughs> of somebody asking you that, that the, those hard questions. Uh, let's see. Let's go down here. Um, uh, 
Well, let's try this one. How has your pandemic life been? You know, welcome to my normal. <laughs> you know, you get up every day, you self-motivate, you organize your day, you maintain relationships, you do your work. Uh, yeah, that is it is not much different than how my life is all the time. Mm -hmm. So the only the real only real drawback is that not not getting tour and tour has always yeah. kind of been, you know, you're, you're the dog that's been in the house all day and it gets to go for a walk once a day mm -hmm. and it goes crazy yeah. and I don't get my walk. So I've kind of I've been on lockdown for two years. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on lockdown since the last book tour. And oh, so for me, that's the only big drawback is I'm still on lockdown. I feel like I had a book out last month and I still feel the lack of, of, of touring. I, 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 and I, I complain about touring sometimes, but then the lack of it suddenly I'm going like, there's a huge hole in my life, not having gone through that. You know, but the, uh, I just got to count the, the next book tour can be extraordinary you know oh yeah i'm already thinking of gimmicks and short stories things mm -hmm. that will put guts into the past my story that makes people faint right things that will be so sort of shocking or amazing and so uh you know i just have to count on that that, that will happen someday that's great i love i i'm I ready to see that or hear that this is um, from Michael. This is a very specific question. Are you a Neil Gaiman fan? I am, you know, and it's funny because one of my, uh, my warnings is I try never to meet writers that I like. Mm -hmm. And I ended up having dinner with Neil Gaiman in <sighs> Mantua, Italy, mm. because his, uh, his daughter was in a graduate uh, college program there. And I was there for a book festival. And he promised that when they were making the animated movie Coraline here in Portland, he was going to look me up. And he didn't look me up. And he mm. didn't ask me out to dinner. So I've been a little sour on Neil Gaiman since then. <laughs> so you should so. never, never have dinner with your heroes. All right. Um, you mentioned to me that you had a story you wanted to read for folks. Oh. Hold on. So, can you hear me? Yep, you sound fine. Okay. This is uh, just a, a quick short story, and it is in the, uh, the latest uh, edition of Cemetery Dance. And one of my students got me the in at Cemetery Dance. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I, I'm really grateful to uh, Tyler Jones, and he has a self-published book out right now called Criterium. Uh, it's a novella. So I'm going to give uh, Tyler Jones and Criterium a plug and uh, also Cemetery Dance. But the story is called The Prophecy of Ruth. So that's why the lighting change. <laughs> the Prophecy of Ruth. Ruth squatted down and she pulled at the bottom drawer. The white paint had worn off the knobs and the old wood felt smoother than paint, polished slippery by bare skin, oiled by the oil off so many fingers. Ruth pulled and the wood barked. She pulled and tumbled backwards on the thin rug. A knob had ripped free, showing a metal screw that still sunk in the drawer front. Ruth tossed the loose knob aside and rose to her knees. The drawer had come open a smidgen, so she wedged her fingertips into the crack and she dragged it out, 
one side budged and then the other until the drawer moaned. It slid open with the smell of paperback books found in the baking hot attic on a summer day. She, she saw a mouse at first, a blizzard of black flecks darted and swam over the shreds of paper. And, and Ruth snatched back her fingers and looked and shook her fingers clean. The specks, the black specks became mouse droppings, became sugar ants. But when she, what she saw at last, what they were, they were silverfish. There was nothing to see but the, but the mouse nest. And even that wasn't a nest. It was just paper. Slips of paper filled the drawer. They filled it to the brim, folded slips of paper, hardly bigger than a fortune cookie, some with a ragged edge, some torn from yellow legal pads and others just regular white paper that had yellowed with age. Each was folded smaller and folded smaller, creased and pinched tight to make a little packet. Kneeling on the thin rug, Ruth picked one up. She held the packet at arm's length, no telling what might fall out, as she picked one loose edge and opened it. It looked blank until she turned it over. Someone had written the length of the paper in black ink. Penmanship in letters as round and curling as pubic hair. Cursive, her father would call it. Her father's handwriting in black ballpoint pen. Bureau, her father would call it. Ruth read, quote, November 1985, the furnace is making that noise again, unquote. She set the paper aside and stuck her hand into the drawer for another, as if she were choosing in a lottery, she dug around. Her hand swam through the folded papers, stirring them. She tossed them like she would toss a salad. Her fingers closed around another paper and she lifted it, shook it free of possible silverfish, opened it. In that same round handwriting, it read, quote, September 1982, Africanized honeybees will attack this state next summer, unquote. Killer bees, he meant. Ruth smiled to herself. She plunged her hand into the folds of paper and plucked out another. This read, quote, April 1988, Susan is coughing again, unquote, in the same hairy handwriting. This one hurt. Her father had meant his wife. He'd written this three, four years before that she had been diagnosed with cancer. If he had done anything more than write this note, and stash it away, Ruth's mother might be here right now, helping collect his things for charity. She chose another folded secret, quote, Benny despondent, unquote, dated 1997, from killer bees to her brother's, brother's depression. It wasn't that her father hadn't worried about the wrong things. Her father hadn't worried about anything. Another slip read, quote, June 9th, 1977, Desmond found a lump on his testicle, unquote. Whoever Desmond had been, if he'd asked her father for advice, Ruth guessed that Desmond was probably dead. Quote, March 1998, Benny says he's going to kill himself, unquote. Her father had written these, these words, folded them and socked them away like Scarlett O'Hara procrastinating her panic. Ruth plunged her hand back into this, this collection of her father's worst fears. She had Dale Carnegie to thank. Maybe Dale Carnegie hadn't invented it, but he had turned it into a thing. Her father had read Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence Strangers. He'd pressed Benny to read How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. In it, Dale Carnegie would write his worst fears on a slip of paper. He'd fold the paper and toss it into a drawer. Every year, he would dump out the drawer and read his worst fears. 
and laugh over how none of them ever came to pass. Around the time that Harpo Marx made a cameo appearance on I Love Lucy, Dale Carnegie had died from Hodgkin's. Ruth Fishta, another worry out of the past. This one read, quote, Ruthie says the Pontiac smells hot after she drives up Webster Hill, unquote. This one dated August 1979. The engine had never caught fire. The radiator had never boiled over. Her father had squirreled away her concern and nothing had ever come to pass. Kneeling on the rug now, Ruthie plucked out another false alarm. She chose the harmonic convergence of August 1987 when all the planets in the solar system were supposed to align and their combined gravitational fields would devastate mankind. She unfolded notes about the Y2K doomsday bug of 1999, the Nibiru meteor of 1995, bird flu, SARS, the global cooling of 1972, peak oil, swine flu, the 2012 Mayan day of annihilation, acid rain, ozone depletion, Africanized honeybees, she read notes about the 1974 satellite photos showing the Arctic ice sheet advancing and a new ice age imminent. She read about collapsing frog populations. Her father and Dale Carnegie weren't alone. No less than Joan Didion had done this exact same thing. Joan Didion, the most famous writer of her generation during the years Didion had lived in a derelict mansion on Franklin Avenue in Los Angeles in what she wrote had been a, a senseless killing neighborhood. She'd written down the license plates of trucks that parked outside, trucks that circled the block, suspicious trucks. Didion wrote about the notes in her essay collection, The White Album. She had put all of these license numbers into a drawer for the police to find after that she would someday be murdered by a stranger. And no one ever arrived to butcher Joan Didion. That summer, death went to Sharon Tate's house instead. Ruth closed both her eyes and listened to the sounds of the house, the pop of a window frame warming in the sun. The wooden joint popped like her father's knuckles the clock ticking at the foot of the stairs sounded the same as the metal parts when the oven in the kitchen heated up. She sunk both hands into the folded bits of paper, scooped up years of fear. One cupped handful of terror she let spill down onto the other papers, rustling papers, papers cascading over papers, dread poured upon dread, all these days and years a jumble. She chose another, quote, July 2017, Zika virus to destroy the next generation of children. She picked out, quote, June 1968, mercury and other heavy metals to wipe out all tuna populations. Some papers, her father had rolled tight like cigarettes. These had sunk to the bottom of the drawer. From among these, she unrolled Quote, May 1970, the pimple on my leg won't heal, unquote. Some notes, full pages, folded one way, then folded the other, so they unfolded like old road maps, paper napkins folded down to the size of postage stamps, compressed, pressed, pinched, crushed, crushed, so the worry would never escape. Here was her father. Here was her father as a young man and an old man pecking away on a typewriter or scribbling with a pen. In this drawer, he lived every age at the same time, the terrible handwriting of his growing up. It surrendered to the terrible handwriting of old age. All of his fears from monsters under the bed to the West Nile virus, they were stockpiled here. Papers like the little notes that kids palmed from hand to hand in grade school, origami with any loose flap tucked to stay closed, the dried ink stuck so shut, so long, the folds tore when her fingernails tried to pick them apart. Quote, Rosie not eating her food again, July 1974. 
unquote. Rosie, Rosie was Ruth's long ago poodle. He'd written in May of 2018, quote, that boy at the supermarket asked if Ruthie is still married, unquote. On the surface, this didn't look like a problem unless her dad had left out some detail. But why, why take note of it if it hadn't been a worry? Quote, boy at the supermarket asked if Ruthie still lives in town. He drove past her house for a look. Unquote. This was in June of 2018. Ruth lay the strips of paper next to each other, organizing them by date, the oldest to the most recent. She put, quote, August 1978 is Trixie on her last legs, unquote, next to May 1982. The gypsy moth will destroy all North American hardwoods in the next five years, leading to catastrophic wildfires. Between them, she placed March 1979, acid rain to deforest the entire continent. Uh, Trixie had been her mom's split leaf philodendron. Ruth saw how the news media had dialed the panic up and down year by year. She jigsaw puzzled notes together, looking for a pattern, or just to create a pattern because even a fake understanding felt better than, than real chaos. Ruth tossed aside notes about the snowpocalypse of 1989. They piled up in a white drift with the snowpocalypse of 1998 and 1999 and 2003, the snowzilla of 2005. She found, quote, September 2000, right upper rear molar feels loose. Then, quote, boy at the supermarket says that they went to school together. He says he wants to touch her hair when he bags, Sus uh, when he bags Ruthie's vodka. He double bags without her asking, but she never says thanks, unquote. Also dated June 2018. Then, quote, Boy not working at the market, cashier won't say why, July 2018. Then swine flew back. Then Ruthie's cat went missing, August 2018. Ruth pulled the drawer free of the dresser. She knelt leaning over it, this open wooden box brimming with her father. She could picture him revisiting his old terrors and and chuckling over the horrors that had never come to pass, the meteors that hadn't annihilated the planet. After a lifetime of killer bees and acid rain and ozone holes and, and bird flu, why worry about the bag boy at the neighborhood price chopper? Being scared of everything had left her father afraid of nothing. She listened to the house settle around her. Clouds had cut the sunlight a wind rose as the sun was beginning to go down. In the dim light, dimmer now, she could hardly read, quote, heard a new noise in the attic today. This one was dated just before he'd been found. Dated a day later, quote, mislaid the good butcher knife, unquote. Ruth stretched to reach the lamp atop the dresser. She turned on the light. The fears now lay on the rug in a circle all around her. Patterns emerged in the handwritten little headlines, ozone depletion tied to terminal skin cancer and bisphenol A in plastics tied to testicular cancer. Causal effect, her father would call it. Unbalanced possibly schizophrenic bag boy at the neighborhood market, tied to missing cat, tied to noises in the attic, tied to her father found dead from an apparent fall down the basement stairs. Ruth smiled over how her father must have spooked himself, how he would have sat here gloating over the impending ice ages and rising sea levels and atom bombs and sarin gas 
and coronaviruses that had gone to somebody else's house instead. He had listened to the house tick, the clock in the hallway tick, and he'd cracked his knuckles to echo the window frames cooling in the sunset. And not the next earthquake or the next earthquake or the next would be the big one that would tip everything sideways and tumble them all into the sea. And Earth and Ruthie felt a smug pride. She looked at the time on her phone. If he were alive, her father would write, electromagnetic radiation from cell phones will kill us all. And today's date, the time was 8.32, later than she'd guessed. Among the last pages she opened, she read, she read, there is no God. We will not be reunited. Nothing comes after, unquote. This one was dated the day that he had fallen, maybe. The medical examiner had been hard to pin down. Here would be her father's legacy to her, while other people had stampeded around, raving about genetically engineered corn and spontaneous hive collapse tied to crop failures and famine. Her father had remained serene. He had not joined the chicken little and turkey lurky crowd and screamed about the sky always falling. The sky wasn't falling. Ruth listened to the sounds of her father's house, the harmless sounds of the house settling around her. She was her father's child, a stoic. To embrace this fact brought her a calm, sweet certainty that she would never, ever lose her head. Among the last notes she read, one last fear, quote, Ruthie will never appreciate how much I love her, unquote. She pressed the paper flat on the rug, kneeling there in the circle of light from the lamp. The words weren't written, these words, weren't written in her father's hairy cursive. These words belonged to a stranger. And she looked at them for a long time until behind her, she heard the, the doorknob turn. She heard the hinges squeak and the bedroom door began to drift open. The yeah. end. Campfire story. Terrific. Thank you very much for that. That was wonderful. So we've gone two hours. Mm -hmm. I call it truth. I want to thank you very much. Oh, this has been, been terrific. Great. Thank you so much for um, enduring <laughs> all this. Mm. Next year for the paperbacks, let's both do a great tour, okay? That would be great. I'd love to. And I want to thank everybody. Dolores, everybody, Michael, everybody for, for coming in. Tiffany, everybody, Andrea, everybody, Lily. Yes, all these names, Evan. So I hope I see you soon and I hope you're all well. And Holly, thank you. I don't have a beef with Rebecca. I love Rebecca. <laughs> Nikki, Elizabeth, I gotta go. I swear I gotta take a piss like crazy. So that's my eloquent good night. Right. Thank you very much. You take care. You too, man. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.